Everybody, could you please confirm that you can see me or hear me? Hello, yes, we can. Okay, great. I will share my screen as we will begin. Okay. Do you see my screen, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, as you remember, last time we discussed uh, we discussed some topics related to brand uh, management. Uh, today we will continue this analysis. So, uh, could you please remind me uh, at which topic we have uh, finished our previous lecture? If I'm mistaken, we arrived at this table after that, we have stopped. Am I correct? Mm, we, uh, we stopped uh, somewhere on that slide. Okay, so, uh, have we discussed the problem of uh, cannibalization? Don't think so. Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, here uh, at this slide you see the definition of the phenomenon of the cannibalization of brands. So, what is it? It is uh, the phenomenon of destruction of one of company's brands by another brand of the same company. Do you understand what it means? Destruction of one of company's brands by another brand of the same company. What is it? How it can be done? Any ideas? Isn't uh, that uh, the uh, same example with uh, Coke Zero? Absolutely correct. In this case, what do we have? Uh, in case of uh, cannibalization, uh, the problem with that uh, we get two or more brands which are targeted uh, to the same audience. Uh, and that uh, and brands have um, similar features, so to say. In this case, members of our target audience. Um, um, uh, okay, what, what do we have in this case? Uh, our brands start competing with each other. Instead of uh, well organization, uh, instead of good organization of our brand portfolio, we create an artificial competition between our brands. Uh, as you understand, this competition is not intended. We did not expect that this uh, competition would uh, take place. But unfortunately, due to some mistakes in our brand planning, this competition uh, emerges. So, we have two or more brands. Okay, uh, there may be uh, there may be cases of multiple cannibalization, so to say. Uh, in this case, our brands start, as we say, in, uh, as we say in Russian, eating each other. Uh, our target audience cannot understand which brand to choose. And uh, our audience may switch to a new brand instead of the older one. Uh, so, in this case, our older brand will be cannibalized by a new one. The case of Coke Zero is absolutely correct. In this um, uh, this product, Coke Zero, or better, this new brand, uh, this new product brand, Coke Zero, uh, partially destroyed the position of the traditional Coke brand. As you understand, we have to avoid this situation. We have to avoid the situation uh, because it uh, it uh, creates problems for our traditional brands, and moreover, it dilutes the image of our company in uh, in customers' minds. Guys, do you understand? Is it clear? Okay. Uh, uh, could you please uh, clarify uh, the last uh, statement about diluting the image? So, like. Um taken it into parts or what could you please repeat the question uh, so uh your first uh, your last uh, statement was that uh, cannibalization somehow um 
harms uh, the brand by diluting it, it in uh, Do you understand what, what it means, uh, dilution? Uh, no. <laughs> Can you please clarify? Okay, in this case, what do we have? Mm, our brand uh, becomes less clear for our target audience, or better, our brand portfolio becomes less clear for our uh, target audience. Normally, each brand should have its its own target audience. When there are two or more brands competing for the same audience, the image of each brand becomes less clear for our customers. Okay? Yes, okay. Now I got it. Okay, so uh, so uh, let's continue. What, uh, a com what a company should do uh, in order to ensure a high quality of its brand portfolio management. Obviously, the company should avoid uh, cannibalization of brands. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what it means? In case of cannibalization of brands, we have two negative effects. The first effect, I have already mentioned it, it is that uh, our brands become less clear for our uh, customers and that, okay, uh, we have, uh, we have um, a risk that sales of one, uh, one of our brands will f uh, fall due to the mergers of a new brand. Okay, uh, so uh, instead, instead of uh, how should I say, instead of a synergy between our brands, we have an effect of cannibalization. It is really very bad. And the next problem is that we will lose our investments, uh, investments done into the uh, brand which is cannibalized. So uh, cannibalization of brands creates sales risks for our company and creates financial risk for our company. Obviously, this situation should be avoided. In order to prevent these risks, uh, companies should clearly identify uh, each target audience and how should I say, uh, link each audience to any uh, to a specific brand. So each brand should be uh, oriented towards a specific audience. Uh, last time, if I'm not mistaken, we discussed this problem with uh, Asil Beck. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure about it. Uh, we mentioned the case of Volkswagen Group, which owns a lot of different uh, a lot of different brands. And actually, the problem with that, uh, in some cases, in some cases, these brands are somewhat overlapping each other. So, uh, uh, target audiences uh, of these brands are partially the same. For example, in case of Skoda, uh, of uh, top models of Skoda and uh, Volkswagen, okay, there are uh, there is uh, some overlapping, which leads to a partial cannibalization of brands. Uh, it creates an unnecessary competition between these brands. So, uh, in case of brand portfolio management, we also should have uh, we also should pay attention to financial decisions. Obviously, obviously, uh, in case of uh, brands, uh, we have to invest into their development, uh, and we should clearly understand which brands we will use and for which target audience. Our target audiences may, may be very different. They, uh, we can create, we can, uh, how should I say, we can identify different target audiences for different countries or for different regions, uh, for different age groups, for different uh, gender groups, etc. But we should, we should clearly uh, identify our target audiences. We should clearly uh, identify a list of our brands, and we should obviously uh, link each brand to each target audience in order to avoid this cannibalization and this overlapping. And uh, the last but not the least, we should ensure a growth of brand equity. Guys, do you have any idea uh, about what brand equity means? So uh, the different brands of the same company should be um, plus minus uh, the same due to uh, their, I know, largeness or what? No. size. 
Not exactly. Brand equity, we'll discuss it a little bit later, but uh, to put it simply, it is the uh, preferences of the brand by uh, our target audience. Uh, equity means that um, brand equity means that our brand is available for our customers, and we should increase this value in order to increase the total value of our company. Obviously, the higher is the equity uh, of our brand, the higher is the value of our company. Okay, let's continue. Uh, what are typical mistakes in case of brand portfolio management? Too many brands in too many segments. Guys, could you please uh, specify what it means? Too many brands in too many segments. Mm, can we uh, uh, give an example of Zbear? So, uh, it has uh, many brands in many spheres, so sometimes it is confusing to customers to um, to um, to uh, somehow create an image of the uh, bear's brand. Okay, probably it could be a good example. Actually, I wouldn't agree because uh, Sber is trying to uh, build up an ecosystem. And in case of an ecosystem, there should be uh, a lot of brands. But technically, technically, your idea is correct. Uh, the problem of too many brands and too many segments is that it leads to, uh, to confusion. Uh, customers do not understand uh, what brands uh, they can choose and okay, uh, what segment technically they can belong to. It also creates problem for the company itself because uh, too many brands in too many segments uh, makes uh, makes the image of the company unclear, and moreover, uh, too many brands requires too much investments, obviously, because each brand should be supported financially. Uh, so in this case, in this case, we can say that uh, brand management is inefficient uh, due to uh, huge investments and due to a potential confusion of uh, brand image and customers' uh, minds. Okay, the second problem, uh, too many brands in comparison with customers' needs. What it can mean, guys? Too many brands in comparison with customers' needs. So customers uh, just uh, don't want uh, those brands. So they are uh, there are too many of them. Okay, actually, actually, we have more brands of customers have needs. Uh, uh, it means it means that some our uh, some of our brands are just unnecessary. They do not correspond to typical needs of our customers. It is the first problem. The second problem is the problem of cannibalization. Uh, it means that for one specific customer's need, we have two or more brands. So uh, it leads to confusion, obviously. And again, it leads to cannibalization. So we should clearly identify our customer's needs and we should link uh, each need to a specific brand. Otherwise, there will be confusion and there will be cannibalization. Second, duplication and overlap. Technically, it is very similar to the previous problem, duplication and overlap. It means that uh, some brands, some brands just reproduce each other. Okay, obviously, they, uh, they are different from the technical point of view. They are different logos, for example, or different colors or different names. But technically, they are oriented to the same target audience. Again, it leads to unnecessary investments into brand development and it leads to confusion and to cannibalization. Overlap, guys, what it means is that I would describe the situation as a partial duplication. Uh, overlap uh, describes the situation when a brands are not absolutely similar to each other, but they have similar features. They may partially cover the same target audience. And okay, uh, okay, it also uh, dilutes the image of these brands and it leads to confusion. So, as you understand, I repeated the word confusion many times. Ladies and gentlemen, you should clearly understand it. In case of brand management, we should avoid any confusion between or any confusion of our brands. Each brand should have a clearer 
image, it should have clear uh, values, um, clearly distinct from uh, values of other brands of our company, and it should clearly correspond to a specific uh, segment with specific needs. Otherwise, otherwise there will be confusion. Your brand image will be unclear, and your investments uh, into uh, this brand may uh, may uh, be inefficient. And the last uh, problem: gaps in priority market segments. What it is, guys? Gaps in priority market segments. So uh, the whole. Uh package of brands of the company uh, doesn't cover uh, the main market of the company. Okay, I would specify your, I would develop your idea a little bit, ladies and gentlemen, what it means. Mm, okay, uh, it means that uh, our company has some priority market segments. So the, we have some crucial uh, customer audiences, which are very important for our uh, business and for our cash flows, obviously. But we don't have brands that would correspond to some of these segments. It means that some uh, of these segments are not covered from the brand point of view. We don't have any brands that would uh, satisfy uh, this segment's needs. And obviously, it will uh, dramatically reduce our potential for uh, financial success, obviously, because customers now prefer brands. And each market segment should have a specific brand. So, uh, as you understand, uh, duplication and gaps are somewhat uh, contrary situations uh, in case of brand management. In case of duplication, we have too many brands for one segment. In case of gaps, we don't have uh, a brand for a specific segment for a specific segment which is which is important for our company. Obviously, both situation uh, both situations should be avoided. Uh, again, one brand per one market segment. Okay, guys, is it clear? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Let's continue. Let's continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, brand extension, guys. I hope you understand what it means. Brand extension. Uh, in the uh, it means that. Uh, one of our brands, or maybe our general brand, so to say, uh, is uh, used beyond its basic product category. Uh, we have discussed this example during our previous lecture, Mars. As you know, originally it was a chocolate bar. Okay, it is. Uh, it, it still is a chocolate bar. But in addition to this uh, product category, uh, the Mars brand is now uh, used also for ice creams and chocolate drinks. Okay, I hope all of you have seen Mars ice creams. Chocolate drinks are less popular, but still they are available on the market. So Mars, Mars is now used uh, not only for chocolate bars, but also for ice creams and chocolate drinks. It is exactly what we discussed, if I'm not mistaken, with Asselbeck, that uh, Mars, despite its association, its very strong association with uh, chocolate bars, is used also for ice creams and drinks. Guys, is it clear? Ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it is. Uh, do you have some other examples of such brand extension? Okay, I would say Bounty. Uh, maybe we'll... Procter & Gamble? Uh, Procter & Gamble, could you please specify? Uh, they have uh, different uh, different brands like uh, Tide, Ariel, Pampers that that uh, constructs this Procter & Gamble brand too. Not exactly. These uh, tight, uh, tight, RL, etc. Uh, brands uh, they describe specific products. Uh, we have discussed it during our previous lecture that uh, Procter and Gamble is just a company name. It's a, it's maybe a corporate brand, but it is not always used to support uh, these specific products. But can we say that tight brand is used for um, uh, for some other products beyond its uh, basic product category? No. 
Okay, so in case of Procter and Gamble brands, uh, product brands, I mean, there are no examples. Okay, as far as I know, probably you can correct me. Uh, in case of Procter and Gamble, there are no specific corporate, uh, so, sorry, specific brand, uh, specific product brands, which are used beyond the uh, basic um, basic product categories. Ladies and gentlemen, maybe you have some examples from other uh, markets. Not necessarily, uh, not necessarily uh, Procter and Gamble, for example. Some other, uh, some other products. I mentioned during I... our previous lecture that Bounty uh, Two is used not uh, not only for chocolate bars, uh, but also uh, but also for chocolate drinks and ice creams. Absolutely the same situation as in case of um, Mars. Okay, I said back. You had an, you had an idea. I uh, have an idea. Uh, okay, for example, in Russia, we have uh, this brand. Uh, it is called Komus. So originally, it uh, produced only some office uh, stuff. But as I know, uh, now it also produces some uh, specific stuff for for some companies like... Um, like packaging uh, for for uh, Russian Post and so on. So it's not really? just yes. So it's not just paper and some pencils. So okay, they are I, trying to I'm... develop something else. Okay, maybe why not? I don't know about this example. Uh, I'm not sure about its correctness, but okay, uh, let's do because in this case we should clearly identify what uh, type of products uh, Office Uber are. But well, okay, why not? Some uh, some other examples, guys. No examples. Okay. Um, well, there is no in my okay. mind. Okay. So let's continue. What are advantages of a brand extension? Mm, okay, mm, in this case, in this case, uh, you can you can increase uh, you can develop your brand image. Uh, so if you use your brand beyond your beyond its basic product category, it means that you are able to uh, how should I say? Mm. Uh, to extend its target audience. You can make your brand more popular and more recognizable on the market. And obviously, in this case, in this case, mm, you can increase uh, the popularity of your uh, brand. You can increase its image, and it will it would help it would help to uh, how should I say uh, to uh, make your company more uh, recognizable, more more noticeable on the market. Again, uh, again, what else, guys? Uh, you can um, you can uh, use your brand reputation. Uh, I didn't put this information on the slide, but you should clearly understand that uh, this possibility exists. Uh, in case of a brand extension, you can use as the uh, image the image of your existing brand for promotion of your new products. So your brand image, uh, your traditional brand, is used as a support for new products. In this case, you don't create new brands for new uh, product categories. You simply include these new product categories into your existing brand. So, uh, so obviously, obviously, uh, it helped these new product categories uh, to benefit from the existing image. It's very good. Again, uh, it uh, create uh, it creates a better choice for customers because they believe, um, they trust your traditional brand, your existing brand, for its uh, basic products. And if new products are marketed uh, under this uh, brand, obviously customers may believe, may trust these new products too. And obviously, uh, we can reduce brand development cost. If our brand is used for just one product category, okay, all cost, uh, all cost for this uh, brand development should be covered uh, from sales of this uh, product. But if brand, uh, if this brand is used for several product categories, obviously, obviously. Uh, <coughs> 
uh, we can uh, get economies of scale, so to say, uh, first of all. And uh, second, second, we, we don't have to develop new brands for new product categories. It's, it's very good again. The next pro but obviously there are some problems. A loss of reliability is the most important of them. Our customers are used to the uh, traditional basic category of this brand. If they see that this uh, brand is used for new product categories, especially in case that these uh, product categories are very far from the basic one, our customers may believe that your brand is no more reliable and may uh, it may not uh, may not uh, choose this new product. I can I can cite uh, a very famous example of Xerox. Uh, guys, you probably know uh, Xerox is on the leading brand of, of photocopiers. In the 80s, if I'm not mistaken, in the 80s or in the 70s, it was pretty uh, long time ago, but still it is a very good example. Uh, in the uh, 80s, if I'm not mistaken, where the, when there was a personal computer revolution in the United States, uh, Xerox uh, wished to participate in this revolution. Uh, Xerox wished to launch its own uh, PC products, its own personal computers, so its own, uh, how should I say, uh, office computers uh, uh, on the market. And obviously Xerox used its well-established Xerox brand for these new computers. It was a great failure actually because customers were used to Xerox as photocopiers and they did not believe that Xerox was able to produce good computers. And it was a great fair because uh, this line, uh, this line didn't manage to attract customers and uh, Xerox stopped producing personal computers very soon after this, uh, after this start. So, so uh, customers uh, thought that uh, personal computers are technologically very far from the basic product of Xerox from photocopiers, and they did not believe uh, in uh, Xerox uh, photocopiers. So, uh, in this case, Xerox should have chosen a different brand for its computers. So, so uh, one of the problem in this case um, is the situation of umbrella brands. Uh, when we choose the same brand for a lot of different product categories. Uh, in this case, our brand can also lose uh, its reliability because customers uh, personally think that uh, a company that a company should be a professional in one product only if one brand is used uh, if one and the same brand is used for many product categories uh, this situation is considered by customers as a loss of reliability uh, we can go back uh, to the example of mars as you understand ice creams chocolate bars and chocolate drinks are very very close from the uh, customer's point of view, uh, but uh, and in this case, this brand accession was quite successful. But uh, photocopiers and uh, personal computers are uh, very distant from the technological point of view, and this is why this is why it was a failure. Guys, do you understand? Is it clear, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, I hope so. Let's continue. Now we can go to a very interesting uh, situation, the situation of rebranding. Rebranding. It is a situation of partial or complete substitution of an existing brand by a new one. A partial or complete substitution of an existing brand again by a new one. So we either uh, change some elements of our existing brand uh, by introducing new elements, or we completely substitute our existing brand by a completely new brand. When this uh, tool is used, first of all, for repositioning of the brand. Guys, do you understand what repositioning is? No. Okay, it means it means that we can move our brand from one target audience to another one. So, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, an example of uh, BMW, BMW, uh, which was done uh, okay uh, in the 
80s, I guess, uh, before this period of time, uh, BMW was, uh, please check this information on Wikipedia, I'm, I may be wrong, uh, before this period, um, BMW was, uh, how should I say, a medium class uh, car brand, not very prestigious. Uh, but uh, but um, after this repositioning, uh, BMW uh, became a very popular and I would say one of the top car brands on the market. One good example would be maybe ladies from our course uh, can remember it. Cosmopolitan. Do you know this magazine, guys? Cosmopolitan. Not me. I don't know. Ladies, do you have any ideas? Or oh, Cosmo magazine, to put it short. Okay, guys, Cosmopolitan, it was an intellectual magazine for men, started, uh, if I'm mistaken, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it was indeed an intellectual magazine for, uh, for men audience. But uh, some time ago, okay, pretty uh, long time ago, Cosmopolitan was rebranded as a women fashion magazine. So it was a complete okay, it was a complete rebranding with a full change of the target audience. Guys, do you understand? It? So, so, so you mean uh, the Cosmopolitan company had uh, worked with uh, with different audience? Which have a low income, and they have they change their brand, and try to uh, try to pick up a new audience, which have not exactly, income. not exactly the target audience of the uh, of the uh, former version of the Cosmopolitan magazine were men, men with uh, high income and men uh, in, uh, interest in um, intellectual things, so to say. But after rebranding, uh, this uh, magazine completely shifted from men to women, and from uh, how should I say, from literature and uh, and so on to fashion problems. So uh, it was a complete change in the target audience. It was an example of repositioning from one target audience to another one. Is it clear? Okay. Yes. I said back. Do you but, understand? I said uh, back. Do you understand me? Uh, let me uh, express my understanding. Uh, have have they uh, kept their main audience, or they uh, just uh, strike the switched off to another one? What do you mean by uh, they re retain their basic audience? I mean, uh, you have mentioned that uh, they uh, they uh, were focused on uh, men. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they uh, move it to women or to more rich men, you mean? No, they moved completely from men to women, from intellectual things like literature to fashion things. Okay? Oh, I see. Yes. It's now, now it's clear. Okay, great. So, and the second problem is uh, when we have to distance from negative um, connotations of the previous branding. So, our brand may be destroyed from some negative events, or uh, we can just uh, we can just want to restart our brand. So, in this case, in this case, we may create a new brand. In order to, uh, how should I say, in order to differentiate our new brand image from the previous one. Ladies and gentlemen, let's start uh, with some examples. So, uh, partial rebranding, as you see, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the left part of the slide, we have the earlier uh, version of Uber brand. In the right part, we have a new version of this brand. So, as we can see, as we can see, uh, it was just a partial rebranding. Uh, technically, uh, technically, uh, the name remained the same, corporate colors remain the same, but the style uh, of uh, letters, of the style, uh, the style of uh, writing, changed a little bit. So, now, do you know these brands, guys? Statoil and Equinor. No, not really. 
Stator, it was it was a previous uh, it was a previous version of the brand Equinor. It is a new one. Statoil, guys, do you have any ideas about the uh, field of the activities of this company? Oil and gas energy. Absolutely correct. Uh, stat, what can uh, what can it mean? How do you think? Oil, it's about oil. Absolutely correct. Uh, so, stat, what it can mean? Some uh, statistics. Not exactly. Okay, start oil, guys. It was the state-owned uh, oil company uh, in Norway. The leading uh, oil company in Norway. Uh, well, uh, it was okay. It is still, it still is a very big company. It produces a lot of oil and gas. It creates a huge part of uh, Norwegian uh, GDP. Uh, but now, by it now, they moved to a new, uh, to a new and more friendly brand, Ekinor. So they decided to uh, disrupt their brand image. They decided to move a little bit further from the initial image of uh, oil producing company. Uh, now, now they try to pro propose a more balanced image, uh, Equinor. So, um, how should I say, equality? I would say. So, more balanced image of a company that is um, working in different uh, in different fields, and probably they decided to. Uh, to uh, highlight the Norwegian origin. No. So uh, now, now this company doesn't have any precise, uh, any close, uh, how should I say, this new brand doesn't have um, any strong correlations with the uh, traditional image of Statoil as an oil uh, company. It is a new technology, it is a new, more technological, more, how should I say, more modern image. Guys, do you understand? Is it clear? Well, it's yeah, yeah, it's clear. Okay, let's continue. Uh, but they uh, didn't change the field of their work, right? Uh, obviously not. Obviously not. They still work in the oil uh, and gas industry. But they also pay a huge uh, attention to technological development. So they don't just sell oil and gas, just like uh, Russian companies do, for example. Uh, they develop uh, oil technologies. Uh, they develop um, infrastructure. They develop IT necessary for uh, oil and gas industry, etc. So it is a very technologically advanced company. Okay. Okay. So now we're branding in Russia, guys. Okay, I guess you know this example. Uh, Yandex Denge, uh, Yandex Denge, uh, the previous, uh, the previous uh, brand uh, is placed um, is placed uh, on the left part of the slide. And now, as you know, uh, Yandex uh, Yandex Denge uh, has been sold to uh, Sberbank. And it uh, it underwent rebranding. Now it is Umani. Actually, there are two services within uh, this uh, activity under this brand. Uh, Yukasa, Yukasa, uh, a payment uh, transaction platform for business, and Umani for personal uh, payments uh, for personal payment services. So, guys, what can you say about the previous uh, the previous uh, brand of this Yandex Dengi and about the new brand? And do you understand the reason of this rebranding? Well, the obvious reason is change of stakeholders. Absolutely correct. Uh, the, uh, the previous owner was Yandex, and now after uh, sale to Sber, obviously uh, any uh, historical ties with um, Yandex should be avoided. So the obvious reason is that. So uh, the company, this and or better, the owner of this company, decided to distance itself from uh, from the previous history uh, linked to Yandex as the key stakeholder. Absolutely correct. What about the picture? on the slide uh, what connotations do they have how do you think let's start from the beginning from the yandex dengue uh, what can you say about this picture this is a uh, cash for electronic money okay Germany. okay uh, but okay do you see the uh, yellow wallet on this uh, slide yes yes obviously Golden. 
wallet. Okay, absolutely, absolutely correct. Yandex uh, деньги and uh, a wallet that describes this monetary idea. Absolutely correct. And Yandex is uh, the corporate brand which covers, uh, which endorses the brand of Yandex деньги. Absolutely correct. What we can say about the brand of uh, you money? What psychological connotations do you have? What ideas do you have? Do, what ideas uh, emerge in your mind when you look at this uh, picture? The yes, first I'm... thing which has come up it is uh, that money, some place where I can save virtual money. Okay. And uh, invest somewhere. Okay, what else? Money transactions. Money transactions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here we see uh, here we see what? We can see the letter U, we, uh, the letter U uh, in Russian, obviously. But well, this uh, letter is written in a way that reminds us about English letters I and O. Input and output. It highlights the technological nature of this company. Uh, as this company is designed to uh, support digital monetary transactions, digital financial transactions. I would also say from my personal opinion uh, that we have in and out. So uh, from one user to another one. Uh, it clearly highlights the idea, uh, the idea of payments, of, of payment, uh, of payments between users. Again, you. You uh, means okay in English. It means you. It's about you uh, yourself. You highlight uh, th this um, uh, this word. You highlight that the company is oriented towards you, your customers. So uh, it is a new brand which is absolutely different from the initial brand of Yandex Dengue, and which supports not only the idea of money like the uh, yellow wallet of Yandex uh, did earlier. Uh, it also supports uh, the idea of te the technological nature of this company and its uh, nature as a processor of payments. Guys, do you understand? Is it clear? Yes, but I doubt that all Russians clearly understand this reference to I and O letters because it's not absolutely correct. For me. Absolutely correct. You are absolutely correct uh, because okay. Um, uh, most people will uh, just see, uh, okay, a funny uh, picture for uh, the letter U in Russian. You're absolutely correct. But okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we should understand. We should understand that uh, okay, companies companies may uh, include some senses into in the, into its brands, into its uh, logos, into its uh, pictures, etc., which are not so obvious for users. So uh, in this case, in this case, uh, this image is not so obvious for uh, potential customers, but still it exists. Anyway, anyway, uh, how should I say? Uh, this picture looks, it does look more modern, uh, more advanced, more uh, funny, I would say, than the previous um, picture of Yandex Dengue. So, uh, so it, cor it corresponds to the idea of novelty. And uh, from this point of view, it could be considered as a good image. Okay, guys, do you understand? Yes, sure. Okay. So, so let's continue. Now, probably uh, the most famous example of rebranding in Russia. Uh, this rebranding took place one year ago from Sberbank to Sber. Guys, what can you say about this uh, change in uh, logos? Um, do you have any ideas? Do you have any psychological connotations? Obviously, on the left part of the slide, we have the previous logo of Sberbank. Now, on the right uh, part, we have the new, uh, the new logo. So, uh, the new logo uh, seems um, much more um, user-friendly. And okay. it uh, highlights that now uh, Sber is not uh, only about um, some bank activity, but now it's an uh, ecosystem. So, okay, what else? Also, I would want to highlight the fact that they changed the font of the letters, and mm -hmm. it sort of means that they became 
more modern because on the left side it's just like Times New Roman, very yeah. serious, uh, very like fundamental font. But uh -huh, on, very fundamental, on the right, very good term. Mm -hmm. it's like uh, much more user friendly. Yeah, user friendly, more modern, more how should I say, more progressive. I would even say. Okay, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Uh, it describes. Uh, okay, um, how should I say, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, along with Sberbank, we also have we, uh, along with the word Sberbank, we also have a picture which describes uh, a money box and a wallet at the same time. So uh, the whole logo of Sberbank, uh, the uh, the whole uh, previous logo of Sberbank, highlighted the idea of money, highlighted the idea of stability highlight the idea of fundamental values and uh, now when Sberbank decided to move to an ecosystem uh, they changed they changed uh, the style of their uh, logo uh, they excluded the word bank from their uh, from their brand just to highlight the idea of ecosystem and obviously obviously they moved uh, from the idea of an award to the idea to a more general idea uh, the circle uh, highlights, uh, okay, it highlights the orientation towards customers. Ladies and gentlemen, it was obvious for Sberbank, but it may not be so obvious for customers. And okay, uh, these arrows describes, uh, how should I say, uh, the target orientation of Sber, their, uh, their willingness to reach uh, the goals. Uh, as you see, as you see, uh, the uh, the previous logo of Sberbank was completely green. Okay, partially yellow, as you see, but okay, mostly green. Now the circle, uh, the circle changes its color from green to blue. How do you think? What idea lies uh, behind this um, change in color? Maybe it represents the colors of other logos within the ecosystem. Uh, you are almost correct. Very good idea. It is not about logos of other uh, services with the uh, Sber ecosystem. It's about the idea of the ecosystem. So different colors represent the idea of ecosystem. Uh, there is not just one color. There is not just one service, financial service. There is a whole plethora of different services which can be represented mm -hmm. by these changing colors. Guys, do you understand it? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's how it works. So technically, technically, what can we say? Uh, the brand name uh, has been partially changed. The picture has been partially changed. We okay. We uh, maintain the basic idea of the circle, but the connotation of this circle is completely different. It's not uh, wallet anymore. And well, uh, the core part of the bear bank name is bear remained uh, remained uh, intact, so to say. Uh, but now Sber is no more uh, just a bank, it is a whole ecosystem of different services. So it's how it works, guys. Uh, it was an idea of rebranding that uh, helped to distance the new image of Sber as an ecosystem from its previous and very traditional uh, image as a uh, bank, as a state-owned uh, savings banks, uh, reliable and traditional and fundamental. It is a more digital uh, structure. It is a more friendly structure. It is more uh, advanced uh, uh, structure. It is more user-friendly structure. Is it clear, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, it is. OK, great. Great. Let's continue, guys. Well, co-branding. Uh, joint use of different brand names of the same uh, product. Do you understand what is it? Not really. Okay, probably, probably you have uh, seen. I, I'm not sure, but maybe uh, there are uh, there are uh, there are a lot of different advertising campaign for co branding uh, for co branded uh, credit cards. For example, uh, for example, credit cards issued by Alpha Bank and endorsed by Aeroflot. 
for example. So you have uh, logos of two companies on this uh, credit card, uh, Aeroflot and Alpha Bank. And again, you have specific, you have special terms um, when you pay for Aeroflot tickets with this card. And obviously you can collect points uh, for your Aeroflot flights that can be used to pay for all your Alpha uh, Bank products. So in this case, in this case, for the, uh, there are two brands for the same product. Uh, guys, do you understand? Is it clear? Yes. So it's uh, some sort of exchange between brands? It is a kind of cooperation between brands. Uh, so in this case, uh, two brands, two brands try to attract a target audiences of the uh, partner brand. Aeroflot is interested in the users of Alpha Bank services, while Alpha Bank would like to cooperate with Aeroflot passengers. Okay. Okay. So in this case, in this case, we have an example of parallel co-branding. What does it mean? In case of Alpha Bank uh, Aeroflot credit cards, okay, both brands are equal, so to say. Uh, they both occup uh, occupy the same place in the product. But there also is the so-called ingredient co-branding. What is it, guys? Uh, for example, uh, for example, as you know, uh, the best processors in the world are produced by Intel, as you know. As you know. So when you buy a computer, uh, I don't know, uh, Samsung computer, for example. Uh, okay, in this case, uh, there will be uh, information that Intel is inside. Okay. So, uh, so uh, Intel and Samsung do, are not equal for this product. The product is branded under Samsung name, but but uh, Samsung uses the strength of Intel uh, as producer of processors in order to highlight the high quality of its products. So uh, Intel is used as an ingredient brand as a component brand, as a brand of a component which is crucial for the success, for the high efficiency of work for these computers. Guys, is it clear? Yes, but I suppose when we're talking about laptops... So, Sophie, could you please speak a little bit louder? I didn't hear you. Yeah, uh, when we're talking about uh, laptops and computers, uh, it's always co-branding, isn't it? Because all the in inner cases, parts in, in of computers cases, are made by different firms. In most cases, it is indeed so. It is indeed so uh, because uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, in most cases, uh, uh, computer manufacturers don't produce uh, don't produce processors uh, themselves. Uh, they buy them uh, from other uh, from other suppliers. And in most cases, it is indeed an ingredient component. You're absolutely correct. Okay. Yes, okay. Okay. Another example is that, uh, do you know this type of, uh, how should I say, a type of uh, uh, synthetic cloth, uh, which is called Gore-Tex? Have you ever heard about it? Yes. Okay, Gore-Tex yeah. is used for winter cloth. Well, winter cloth can be produced, uh, vi okay, winter, uh, winter, I don't know, um, Winter clothes can be produced from uh, different uh, from different tissue, so to say, uh, and can be uh, marketed under different brands. Uh, but uh, but if you highlight that uh, your cloth is uh, your, is produced from Gore-Tex, okay, in this case, this Gore-Tex as an, as an ingredient brand will support will support uh, the image of your uh, of your products. Is it clear, guys? Do you understand it? I'm sorry. Uh, isn't a Gore-Tex? It's a technology of membrane, uh, membrane fabric. Te uh, technology of produces of uh, membrane fabric, and it's not the material itself. Okay, probably I'm not sure about about it, guys. I, I don't. I know the Gore-Tex brand, but I know the uh, but I don't know the technological basis for it. Maybe you're right. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, got it. Okay, so uh, so but in this uh, in this case in this case, okay, Gore-Tex uh, supports uh, support. Okay, Gore-Tex maybe as a technology supports the quality of the uh, of the fabric uh, which is used for the um, produce for the production of this cloth. Okay, guys, is it clear, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. 
So, yeah. uh, so they include uh, this uh, ingredient not just to improve the quality of the product, but uh, to advertise it to buy. Could you specify your idea? Uh, so, uh, clothing uh, companies include uh, Gore-Tex not only to improve the quality of the of their products, but also to uh, advertise uh, their products to their customers. Uh, obviously, 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 of course. Okay. Okay. So let's continue, guys. Let's continue. Mm -hmm. Just a moment. Mm -hmm. Well, what are advantages of co-branding, guys? Okay, so uh, I have discussed it a little bit uh, when we mentioned um, Alpha Bank Aeroflot uh, credit cards. Okay, in this case, um, we have uh, uh, an opportunity to add value to our brand. Uh, or better, to add value to our product. When we offer our customers uh, just an Alpha Bank credit card, okay, our customers know that they will get access mm, to all uh, services of Al Alpha Bank, but that's all. In case we include Aeroflot brand, okay, in this case, our customers may get access to Aeroflot services at specific terms, at special terms. And this, um, this uh, opportunity may create uh, additional value for our customers. It is important for us. It makes uh, our customers choose our uh, credit card and maybe it can make uh, Aeroflot passengers to choose our uh, credit cards too. So, so our product uh, becomes more valuable for our customers. It is really, very important. And again, as I already said, we can get access to new customers. Uh, so, Aeroflot passengers may choose our uh, may choose our uh, credit cards, uh, our Alpha Bank Aeroflot co-branded cards, because as Aeroflot passengers, they can get access to special terms provided by Alpha Bank. So it's good. In this case, we can increase our audience. We can increase the number of our customers thanks to cooperation with um, with uh, other brands. Ladies and gentlemen, do you understand? Is it clear? Yes. Okay. What are risks in this case? Mm, unfortunately, unfortunately, as usual, we can uh, lose we can lose control uh, over our brand, over the policy of our brand. In case we use our own brand, okay, um, mm, we can decide uh, upon the policy of our brand. Nobody can uh, tell us how we should organize our sales, our marketing policy, etc. In case of a cooperation, obviously, we have to design our uh, brand policy uh, together. And uh, sometimes, sometimes there may be conflicts. Uh, our brand image, okay, uh, if uh, if our partner has problems, its problems uh, will uh, create harms for our brand, etc. So, as uh, as usual, any cooperation creates not only advantages but also risks. Ladies and gentlemen, is it clear? Um, okay. By the way, can there be a situation when uh, our partner is trying uh, to somehow uh, use our brand to um, to promote its own one and uh, it is harmful for us so uh... <laughs> for example um, I don't know maybe uh, at some uh, stage uh, Cortex could try to um, to produce its own uh, clothes using its partner's uh, technologies. 
In most cases, in most cases, our partner will not get access to our technologies. As you understand, Aeroflot is not a bank. Uh, Alpha Bank is not a, uh, is not an, an airline, so it would be very difficult for them to copy uh, technologies of each other. It is more logical for them to copyright instead of trying to steal uh, instead of trying to steal um, their partners' products or technologies. Okay. Uh, Could you please provide an example of loss of control? Of loss of control. Okay. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Technically, now I don't remember about such examples. I will be honest. Uh, I will try to think about it. And if I remember, I will uh, go back to this question. Now, uh, frankly speaking, I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember any examples. Um, <laughs> No. Uh, most uh, most uh, cases about co-branding are dedicated to successful uh, to successful practices. Uh, the problem of loss of control is discussed uh, at more theoretical level. Okay. 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 However, okay. Mm. There was an example which. Okay, I will try to remember. Please remind me after the end of this lecture. Maybe, maybe it uh, it will it will come to my mind. Okay, so uh, let's go, let's go, guys. Liquidation of brands, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We should understand. We should understand that brands, as all uh, economic phenomena, actually as products, as companies, etc., they have they uh, their own life cycle. And sometimes, sometimes it is necessary to uh, end to put uh, to put an end uh, to a brand. Uh, in case of liquidation of a brand, uh, this brand exits the market. Why such a decision can be taken by a company? Uh, there may be a low financial efficiency of this brand. So this brand demonstrates its uh, inefficiency from the financial point of view, and there is no need for for a company uh, to try uh, to continue using this brand. In addition, there may be a high cost of uh, revitalization. Maybe we can revitalize this brand. We can try to revive it, uh, but it requires a too high cost. And in this case, it is not logical for us from the economical point of view to try to invest money into this brand. Uh, this brand has no financial interest for us, so to say. And uh, in this case, uh, this brand should be stopped. Guys, do you understand it? Yes. OK. OK, uh, such practices do exist. Such practices do exist. Companies regularly stop uh, their brands. Uh, they exclude some brands from their portfolio. Uh, it is quite a normal situation. Uh, well, um, well, uh, mm, normally, normally uh, we should understand that brands uh, is useful for us only when it creates uh, profits. When it stops create, uh, creating profits, in this case, either we should try to revitalize it, or if it is not uh, profitable, okay, in this case, we just stop this brand. By the way, guys, uh, one more case uh, of rebranding, of rebranding. Uh, which may be interesting for you, especially for those uh, of you who are studying po po political studies and uh, so sociology. Uh, as you know, some time ago, the uh, movement Black Lives Matter uh, emerged in the United States. Uh, how it is impacted some historical brands of American products? Do you have any, uh, an idea? As I have, uh, as I have already said, uh, rebranding is used to distance the brand from the negative connotations related to this brand in the past. Uh, do you have any idea about such rebranding in the United States? Rebranding generated by the negative of racial connotations. No, nothing comes to mind. Okay, 
Mm, okay, I will try. I will try to help you a little bit. As you know, as you know, uh, some American products, uh, for example, Uncle Ben's, uh, probably have heard about it. Use picture of black. You uh, use pictures of black Americans, of black Americans like uh, uh, that. Uh, of black Americans who are working as cooks, uh, as plantation workers, etc. Okay, uh, image of uh, pictures of black Americans uh, as good workers actually. But well, now now these uh, pictures are considered to uh, have um, bad connotations. Uh, they are considered to have uh, an image of exploitation of Black American people. And now now uh, companies are switching from uh, using uh, Black um, Black Americans as uh, workers to new pictures which uh, which are distanced from this historical uh, slavery a related past. Guys, do you understand? Is it clear? So it's the rebranding uh, which is caused by some political or uh, social Reasons. reasons absolutely absolutely correct absolutely correct again uh, as you know during the um, uh, slavery period of the uh, american history uh, black americans uh, worked as plantation worker for example so they uh, have a strong ties with agriculture so uh, so to say um, uh, we can uh, we can uh, expect that uh, a picture of an american worker of a black american working on a on a plantation describes this black american American is a good worker uh, who produces good agricultural products. Okay, good agricultural products are obviously attractive for customers. So, uh, black Ameri uh, pictures of black Americans working in uh, kitchens, in uh, plantations, etc., describes uh, the idea of uh, old style uh, American cuisine, of old, uh, old style American homes, etc. But these traditional American homes are uh, strongly related to the history of slavery, to the history of exploitation of black Americans. And obviously now these pictures, these familiar pictures, I would say, now they start having bad connotations and they should replace it by uh, newer, more politically correct ones. Do you understand, guys? Is it clear? Yes. It... Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue. Let's continue. Okay. Okay, that's all for this topic. Guys, if you don't mind, let's have a break. Let's have a break. Uh, and after that, we'll continue with a new, to with a new topic. Okay? Okay. Uh, so at what time... Uh... Do we meet after the I would break? I would I would propose to st to restart our uh, our class at eleven o'clock. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. See you guys. <laughs> 